You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer a slave to fear
of God. Ooh, oh, oh, oh. I have never.
everybody. Pastor Bill is in Midland. Doc, Doc Barkley's conference he's got going on there. Hi, guys. Man, it's good to see you. <laughs> My parents. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Luke chapter 1. I want to encourage you for a minute. Um, we do have an update on these sound panels. We are now up to, we don't have an updated therm, therm, thermometer. I wanted to say thermostat, but we don't have an updated thermometer yet, but the new amount is $2,798.34. So, or as Kara would like to say, $2,799. <laughs> In Luke chapter 1, you know, you know the story about, it's really the start of the Christmas story, right? It's where the angel came and told Mary that she was going to have a baby, Right? And Mary's response at first was, how? It, was, it wasn't a question of unbelief like, you know, that's never going to happen. She just wanted to know how. How? In, in my mind, that's not possible. You have to tell me how it's going to happen, right? And so the, the angel told her, he said, uh, in fact, he said this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, uh, Luke one thirty five. The angel answered and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God right? So he told her how, and then she had a response that was pretty interesting to me. And um, I want to elaborate a little bit or kind of tag team on what Pastor Bill started talking about on Sunday in that we need to do more responding in a service. See, um, for a lot of newer people even, it may be you, you feel like amen is just something you say in a service when you agree with it, right? It, a lot of people get the idea that amen means that's right. That is not what amen means. Amen does not mean I agree or that's correct. That, that's not what it means. What, <laughs> what amen means is so be it or be it so or that's the way I want it to be. That's what amen means. It is actually a statement of faith. You, you hear something in the service that you say, I want that, and you say, amen. It is, it is the word that means, so be it. Be it so. Be unto me according to your word, which is exactly what Mary said in Luke chapter 1. Her response to the angel, I think it's in 37. I think it's Luke 1, 37. Ah, uh, 38. That's the end of the angel's statement. And then in verse 38, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. That's New Living Translation. The New King James says, be unto me according to your word. So in a, in a service, when somebody's teaching you the word and saying, this is what God said, and you want that, the way you receive it, you say something. Because this moment right here, which is, he said, be unto me, according to your word. That was the moment, the word, according to John 1, 1, or John chapter 1, that was the moment, the word that she heard became flesh. Now, she didn't see it until nine months later. But that moment, the moment she received the word by what she said. Okay? So when, when Pastor Bill said that we need to be responding more, he is exactly right. Because a lot of the things we speak up here, a lot of things he says, you need. <laughs> And you're not going to receive it by sitting there wishing, oh, man, if only. Right? Okay? Now, I, you don't say amen to everything. If I said, man, Christians just don't know how to read their Bibles enough, you could say, that's right, or, ah, that's sad. That, that one you probably don't want to amen What's your agreement with it? But you don't want to amen that, you know? So try to be intentional when you say something. 
but make sure you're doing your part in this. Be unto me according to your word. Amen? Right? You got something? Yeah. It's the difference between having a mental acknowledgement that something is right and a heartfelt conviction that something is right. It's like, geez, I can have a mental uh, conviction that Jesus is Lord, but that in itself didn't save me. It was my heartfelt agreement and my words of my mouth that made Jesus my Lord and Savior. Personalize it. And so I received him same way with receiving the word. You got to say it. Exactly. You believe it, you say it, and the word becomes flesh. Right? So when the word says give and it shall be given back to you, same book, by the way, that this is in, just five more chapters. When it says give and you will receive, your response is, I wonder if that works. <laughs> your response is, that's right. Amen. Right? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for everyone in this, in this room, in the sound of my voice, Everyone attached to this fellowship, Father, I pray that your hand of blessing and favor would be on them, Lord, that they would see that your word is true, that they would experience it for themselves and be a living testimony that you are faithful to your promises. Thank you for protecting our pastor while he's in Midland. Bring him home safe and sound and give him a word from heaven tonight. I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, everybody says? Amen. Good. Very good. Praise God. Give me a hand clap of praise real quick. This is fantastic. There we go. That's better. <laughs> How do you know you have a healthy church? Is when the pastor can be gone and we're still here. Right? That's a healthy church. Where the fivefold ministry is, is here with our elders and everybody else. That's a wonderful thing to have, and Brother Chuck, I was praying that you would be here tonight. I really was. You can ask, you can ask my wife. I'm like, I hope Chuck is here, because he lets me know I'm going down the right way. So, <laughs> so uh, we've been talking about the salt life. You guys remember, right? You guys remember what we've been talking about with this, the Beatitudes and all that? We're going to finish up, because I'm sure you guys are sick of me talking about it. <laughs> So we were talking about the Beatitudes. These are the character traits of true believers in Jesus Christ. So when we first started the study, I started out with Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, and then we went back through the Beatitudes to see what makes a Christian the salt of the earth. These characteristics that are called the Beatitudes. Now, we're coming back to 
Matthew 5, verse 13, where Jesus says again, you are the salt of the earth. And we're going to start looking into this a little deeper. So let's read it. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand where it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We're going to focus on what it means to be salt, to be light. Dig into it a little bit, okay? You know, salt's a preserving agent. We talked about this. Salt is a preserving agent. It is an antiseptic, and it adds flavor. Some of the main uses of salt. We as believers, both individually and corporately, as a church, are to be the preserving agent in a rotting society. As an antiseptic, we're just supposed to be the ones that are soothing wounds, leading people to Jesus Christ, that they could be healed. Our lives are to bring the flavor of godliness into a, a, a world that is bland, tasteless. So, I'm going to be honest with you. <clears throat> going through the first... Uh, the, going through the Beatitudes and, uh, and, and those were, were um, now I don't want to say easy, but uh, this specific part where it talks about being salt, being light, it talks about what kind of a believer are you? And God showed me some things about me. You know, God's word is a mirror. And when you look into the mirror of God's Word, it's going to show you some things about yourself. It's not always going to be pretty. I'm going to tell you straight up, it wasn't all that pretty. This, this last study for this section is a little rough on me. <laughs> so keep that in mind um, as I'm going through this here. But I want you to think of a specific question. Now, my daughter was doing a, a study on purity. And while she was doing this little study, um, one of her Bible notification apps popped up a little question, and she came and showed it to me, and I'm like, Phew. goes right in hand with what we're going to be talking about. And the question was, if your church disappeared, would anybody notice? Think of Jesus' question. What good is a salt if it's lost its flavor? What good is a church that has lost its effectiveness? What good are we if we're not effective, if we've lost our saltiness, if we've lost our flavor? question really hit me. Not going to lie. <laughs> that was a <laughs> right in the gut for me. So, you know, God started working on me. Obviously, we can see society is rotten, right? It's pretty dark out there. And it's not the first time it's been dark. You can trace the darkness of sin and the effects of sin all the way back. Let's look at a little bit of history. What's really neat is that the Bible will give you the length of days of the patriarchs. For example, Adam, the first man created by God, 930 years old when he died. If you follow this stuff out a little bit, you'll find out that Adam lived long enough to be able to talk to Noah's dad. If you put the length of years in like a chart, he lived long enough to talk to Noah's father. Adam, the first man. Lamech was 188 years old when Noah was born. Lamech lived another 595 years. 
He died five years before the flood. Noah started on the ark at 595, I believe is what it said, entered the ark when he was 600 years old. Amazing. Little study picks up on this, but put the years together. From creation to the destruction of the entire world and everybody on it, 1,600 years. Roughly. Roughly 600, 1,600 years. How long has it been since Jesus has been here? We're 2020. That's a lot longer than the 1,600 years it took for man to corrupt himself so bad that God said, I regret making man. Let's look at it. Genesis. Look at Genesis, chapter 6. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, so that the very intent, the motives of the thoughts of his heart were evil continuously. Continuously means there was no breaks, no periodic good in there. It was continuously wicked. The thoughts, the intents, the motives of a person's heart. Verse 6, the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth and grieved in his heart. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man, beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. I am sorry I've made them. 1,600 years man had come. And you have to remember, Adam was made perfect. Perfect knowledge of God. Walked with God in the garden. A short 1,600 years later, so corrupt that God destroys everything. Flash forward after the flood, Genesis 11. It's not going to be up here, but we're going to pass through these kind of quick. Noah's son, son Shem is alive still. Population of man slowly rebounding, and their whole desire is fame. They want to build a tower to God. Tower of Babel happened 50 to 60 years after the flood ended. Short time, and they're already trying to build a tower to God in their pride. Can you believe that? Quick, real quick. Now, another interesting thing, if you pay attention to the length of time, Shem lived long enough to see Abraham live and die. He was alive through his entire li Abraham's entire life. What do we know about Abraham? Abraham, of course, the father of many nations, the father of Israel, everything like that. But Abraham talked with God about two special cities that we all should know pretty well, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. Two of the most corrupt cities for their blatant immorality. So much so that God made a special spectacle of these two cities and destroyed them by raining fire from heaven on them. Brimstone. Sulfur, right? Yeah. Pretty corrupt. Look at the book of Judges. Repeated. And Israel did that which was evil in the sight of God. And Israel did that which was evil in the sight of God. And it's over and over. That and the Kings and the Chronicles. Same thing. Israel would be blessed. They'd be doing good. And then they would stop following after Christ, they would allow sin to get in, they would start following other gods, and then God would be like, okay, judgment would come, they would start, I mean, they'd get themselves in trouble, and then they'd cry out to God. God would save them, then they'd be all right, then they'd get themselves in trouble. Over and over and over, they were corrupting themselves, rotten society, even God's chosen They start reaping the fruit of their sins. You might say, yeah, Jeff, that's all Old Testament. That's old school stuff. That's in the first half of the book. Okay, fair. Let's look at when Jesus came, right? Jesus came during the height of the Roman rule. Jesus, spotless, sinless, perfect Lamb of God, led a perfectly sinless life. No reason why he should get in trouble with anybody, right? crucified, beaten in the worst possible way by a completely ruthless government. This is also the Roman rule. This is also the guys that 
you know, would dip later Christians in oil and light the city of Rome with the Christians' bodies. That's how they lit the city. This is the guy that would, you know, if you were a Christian, lop off your head, crucify him. I mean, there's a couple other of the apostles or the disciples that were crucified. Didn't happen to just Jesus. Happened to a few of them. A couple of them, you know, um, beheaded. Uh, I think, it was, was it John the Beloved who was um, exiled to Patmos? I think if it's true, if I remember correctly, he was actually boiled in oil first. But he didn't die. Roman rule. Wicked. Corrupt. But we can keep going. Early church. Think of the epistles, right? Look at what he wrote to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. Look at what he says. I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. These are talking to church people in the church. Something that even pagans don't do, you guys are doing. This is a big rebuke from Paul to the Corinthian church. Corruption in the church. Verse 2, it says, You are so proud of yourself, but you should be in mourning and in shame. See how twisted these guys had it? This was in a church. We can keep going. The Bible lists example of example of this kind of stuff. Let's get current. What about today? What about today? There was a mega church. I read this in a news headline yesterday. A mega church leader said abortion was biblical. Yeah. Biblical. Really? A leader in the church. Pretty gnarly, right? Pretty corrupt. With all this wickedness going around, wouldn't you say society is pretty rotten right about now? Yeah. All right, let me ask you another question. Who's at fault here? Why? Why is it so bad? You can say, oh, well, it's the devil's fault. The devil's fault. It's the world's fault. It's the government's fault. I don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, yes, that is, they are wicked, and they, they, the world system, yes, it is. The goal is to ruin this world. That's the devil's goal. We know this. But they're doing what they do. The world system is doing what it's supposed to do. The devil's doing what he's supposed to do. Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? That's the question. I'm going to make an observation. Too many churches in America are missing the mark. We're missing the mark. Not necessarily us. There are a lot of churches out there that are missing it. Really missing it. Jesus asked, what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? What good is a church that loses its effectiveness? If the church disappears, would anybody notice? It's pretty heavy thought. That's why I said this one was pretty rough on me. You know, because the question I asked, all right, well, if, if, I, if I disappeared, would anybody notice that I was a Christian or not? You know? I'm not talking about if I, like, disappeared, but if, you know, okay, how about this? Let's turn it this way. If, if one of you went to my work and said, hey, do you know Jeff was a Christian? You, you know, the question is, would they be shocked? Would any of your coworkers be shocked? That's the question. It was a hard question for me to answer, you know, because I have issues. <laughs> I do, <laughs> you know. Uh, but what happened to the American churches? What happened to all these churches? Churches sought to be modern, popular. Key words, relevant. We've got to be relevant. Churches pretty much became a business. Granted, yes, there is business that is conducted for a church to be a church and et cetera, et cetera, governmental things and stuff like that. But instead of, they ran like businesses. Pastor almost like a manager. 
you know? They sought to be modern, popular, reverent, became businesses, not so much worried about biblical doctrine, but were, 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 blah, 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 worried about filling the seats. What can we do to fill the seats? Fancy preachers. Now introduce what's called the seeker-friendly church. Seeker-friendly. What's that mean? A seeker-friendly church, they don't preach the whole, counsel, the whole counsel of God's word. Sin? Oh no, you can't say sin. You can't talk about hell. You can't talk about righteousness, repentance, holiness. Why? Well, that's not popular. You're not going to fill the seats if we talk about that stuff. Not talking about conviction of the Holy Spirit. Definitely no talk about hell and God's wrath on sin. Those are unpopular terms. Sermons end up sounding like philosophy, self-help class, you know? Self-esteem instead of presenting the word of truth and living a godly life. These seekers are only interested in an entertainment and getting their ears tickled. Look at Timothy, 2 Timothy 4.3. Paul warned Timothy about this all the way back then. For a time is coming, and I'm pretty sure we're here. We're here. Where people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. Seeker-friendly church. You get these seekers in a church, all they do is really complain about the carpet color. Paint on the walls ain't right. Your message too harsh. These are the kind of people that look for feel-good messages all the time. Messages that condone their lifestyle. But if you get, <laughs> you get these people and you start talking doctrinal truth to these people, and they're like, you know, newborns trying to hold their head up, you know, like, <laughs> you know. Because they want entertainment. They want to be lifted up. But you get serious and start talking doctrinal truths, these guys are passing out in the seats. <laughs> Running to find somewhere else. Uh, somebody will make them feel good, make it lift them up. Not, not challenging a lifestyle. Not calling them to holiness, righteousness, repentance. Not humbling themselves before God. Imagine if you've got churches full of these people. Preachers that are preaching this kind of stuff. You want to fill the seats? There's a lot of them out there. Aren't there? Why is it so dark out here? Why is it so dark out there? Too many of these modern churches in America have lost their saltiness. You can't flavor the world if you're dumbing down the message. You can't be salt. You can't, you know, you, you can't help with being an antiseptic if you're diluting your message, diluting God's word. You can't do it. It doesn't work. I think we see pretty much a lot of evidence all around us, don't we? If you look at Matthew 5.13 again, Jesus asks, what good is salt? It's lost its flavor. Can you make it salty again? Do you notice he never, <clears throat> never really answers that question? He goes on to say it's going to be thrown out. Okay, salt that's lost its saltiness is going to be thrown out. He does ask, can it be made salty again? Can it? Let's figure that out. He doesn't give us an answer. I don't personally know why, but I have a couple reasons that might fit. Maybe he didn't give us an answer because... It's not up to him to make us salty again. It's our responsibility to get in God's word, to pray, to live godly lives. He's given us the grace to live that if we do it by faith, right? That's faith's our responsibility. Maybe he didn't answer this question because it's already been answered in the Bible. Second Chronicles 7:14. We know this verse. What's that say? If my people, whose people? God's people. God's people. The world doesn't need to humble themselves, seek Him, and pray. But that's not what it says, is it? It's God's people that got to start this. 
God's people got to humble themselves. What's that humble mean? Humble means you admit. You admit where you're at. Like I told you guys, this message that as I prepared it was rough. It was rough. I was eating humble pie the whole time. I'm not joking. It was rough. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face. You know, prayer is important. <laughs> you can't have a relation with somebody you don't talk to them. Right? You've got to seek God's face. Seek his face. Don't seek the gift. Don't seek the blessing. Seek the face of God. Blessings come when we do that. We got to do our part, right? Because when we do this, it says, turn from our wicked ways. Repentance, that's what repentance is. It's turning, go in the opposite direction. I was doing this. I'm going to turn around and go this way. That's repentance. Turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear from heaven. We got to do our part. God's ready. To, he's waiting for us to do our part so he can do his part. If we want our land healed, our land restored, then God's people got to start. We got to be the ones to start. If we're to be a good preservative and flavor society with our lives and our surroundings, it needs to start with us. It needs to start with the church body. It needs to start out with us as individuals. Don't misunderstand me here because uh, I'm not saying that this is going on here. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that our church is a bunch of deadbeats and stuff like that. That's not what I'm saying <laughs> at all, okay? I'm just saying that what, what I see in America in general, darkness out there. And what are, what are the churches doing? What are we doing? That's, that's where, where I'm going here. Because I, I don't believe for one minute that this church is anything like that. We have elders that operate in the spirit. We have a wise, godly pastor We've got people who are willing to preach the word and fantastic teachers teaching our kids. We have a healthy church. I really believe that with all my heart. God has placed us here at this time, in this place, to be the salt of the earth, right? Another thing salt does with preserving and flavoring is it makes you thirsty. Anybody like cinema popcorn? I love cinema popcorn. All the butter on it and salt it up. Cinema, yeah. Cinema popcorn. Theater popcorn, all right? Right? That's delicious. You know, you can get a bucket of popcorn for a couple bucks and you wolf it down and then you got cotton mouth afterwards and then you're willing to pay, you know, 10 bucks for a 32 ounce glass of, you know, ice with a splash of pop in it. You know, legalized thievery, but, you know, we keep going. But, but you're willing to pay that, right? Because you're thirsty now. Our lives should make people thirsty for God. Thirsty for the things of God. They should see our lives and be like, I want that. How do I get it? Yeah, how do I get it? I want it. Salt ceases to be salt when it's mixed with other elements. We can't seek to please the world. Let's look at Romans 12, 2. What's it say? Be not conformed to this world. Right? We can't mix with the world and be salt. To conform means to agree or to comply to the rules of, to comply to standards or laws, to comply with socially accepted standards. Look at what's socially acceptable today. You think we can be a good, salty church by conforming to that? Riots in the street and all sorts of craziness going on out there? If we mix with the world, we end up complying with the world. And then pretty soon, you compromise so much that nobody can tell the difference between you and the lost. Which is what 
we got to watch out for. Why? James 4.4 4 tells us why. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I don't want to be conforming to the world anymore. I spent many years doing it. It's brought me nothing but trouble and stress and heartache. Why? Because I had made myself God's enemy. We can't mix in there. We can't, we can't mix with the world and, and, and live a life that is salt to the world because we'll be just like the world. We can't do that. Look, Jesus doesn't stop there at salt. Matthew 5.14 says, You are the light of the world. A city on a, set on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, Jesus said that he was the light of the world in John 8.12, right? Spoke to the people, said, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Jesus said he was the light of the world. Okay, so the question I immediately go, because I'm you know, an analytical, logical thinker, is he said, I'm the light of the world, and then he said, he's the light of the world. Well, which one is it? Well, I heard a pastor explain it like this. Think of Jesus as being the sun. S-U-N, okay? He's the sun. He's the originator of the light. We're the moon. Okay, we don't have inherent light of ourselves. We reflect the sun. Right? Now, what's, when's the only time that the moon doesn't reflect the sun? During an eclipse, that's right. What's an eclipse? It's when the earth passes between the sun and the moon, and the earth blocks the sun's light. Okay? Do I need to explain the analogy? Jesus, the originator of light, we're the moon. We reflect him as he shines on us, and we do our part. We reflect that light to the world. Okay? If the world comes between us and the source of light, Jesus, and we start getting into darkness, right? We get eclipsed. What can cause us to have some eclipses in our lives? What are some things that can get us in trouble here? Let's look at Mark 4. Think of the sowing the seeds, okay? A seed on rocky soil represents those who hear the message immediately with joy. And then, since they don't have deep roots, as soon as trouble happens, they shrivel up. Maybe, maybe you receive the gospel with joy, not really understanding the weightiness of it. The gospel is the power of salvation for those who believe. Maybe if you said, hey, you know, I want that Jesus who will give me a better life. Yeah, sign me up. Woo! You're a Christian, you dork. You're a loser. Oh, no, I ain't saying same for me. I'm out. Maybe you don't know what you were getting saved for. You know, salvation is not a, not a joke. It's not a quick, easy thing. It is something that you've got to realize your sinfulness before a just holy God and understand that the wrath of God rests on you until you bow your knee to him willingly on your own. What else can cause an eclipse? Verse 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represent those who heard God's word, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things. What kind of thorns are we talking about here? Thorns that choke out the gospel. It says, worries of this life. Okay, what kind of worries? There's lots of worries, lots of things to worry about, right? Finances and, you know, the state of the world. I mean, I used to be so wound up in... 
uh, like end times and, you know, thinking Obama was the Antichrist and everything like that. I was so jacked up back then, I couldn't. I was no earthly good to anybody. I couldn't think straight. I was so distracted, eclipsed. Because this thorn of worry and distraction choking out the word in me. About the lure of wealth. Ooh. Wealth, just so you know, it's not wrong. Having wealth is not wrong. It isn't. We got to be careful, though, and I've said this before, we got to be careful that we don't seek the blessing of God more than we are relationship and intimacy with God. It can't take, it can't switch places. And that's where a lot of people can get in trouble because they start seeking that, give me that blessing. I'm going to start chasing that blessing. You got dollar signs and they forgot what God looked like. We can't be there. That's a trap. Wealth is not wrong. But 1 Timothy 6.10, it's the love of money that is the root of all kinds. And it's all kinds of evil. And look at the danger. Craving money, having wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Again, I'm going to say it again so there's no confusion. Wealth is not wrong. Having money is not wrong. But when that money takes the place of God, then you have a thorn that's choking you. And an eclipse is starting to happen because you lost sight of God. And we can't do that. We don't want to do that. You know, that, that used to be another thing that I had problems with. So concerned about money, so chasing the dollar, so worried about it that I wouldn't tithe. Guess what I did? Pierced myself with many sorrows because now I was rejecting God's blessing and I was like opening my arms up and to receive all of the, what's the opposite of blessing? Curses that comes with disobedience. We can't do that. We've got to watch out. We've got to watch out. What about pursuing other things? That's another thorn. Right? Pursuing other things. That other things could be anything, really. But have you ever, have you, ever you know, talked to a person who was at one time in, in the Lord, in faith? You haven't seen him in a while, and you say, hey, how are you doing? You know, you still following the Lord? And they're like, well, you know, I moved on to other things. You ever heard that? I have. Yeah. I've heard that. Other things. You know, we've got to be careful with that too. Because our, our minds are like a box. You get out what you put in. I had a family member that was a believer, strong teacher. And then life happened. He started pursuing other things. Started listening to atheistic debates and stuff like that, and it's gone. Out of the faith. Yeah. Got to be careful about these other things, these thorns. You know, back when we were saved, we were like on fire. Couldn't get enough of God's Word. Couldn't get enough of praising. Constantly thinking about the Lord like we should. And life happens. We allow the thorns to happen. We start chasing those other things, and pretty soon we don't see that the world is creeping across the Son of God and starting to black the light. And pretty soon it's all dark in our hearts, dark in our minds. We don't even think about God anymore. We can't see Him. Because we allowed those things. We've got to be careful there. What are the distractions? Distractions could be a lot of things. A relationship, right? I'll tell you, most things happen with people, position, power, praise, a lot of peas. These things can, uh, if we're not careful, they become distractions to us. Chasing that relationship. Chasing, you know, the power or position in a job and, you know, and doing it in an ungodly fashion. 
You know what? Ministry can be a distraction too. Can it? If you're just going through the motions, ministry can be a distraction. You could do it for the wrong reasons. I did youth group several years ago. Several, several years ago. The wrong motives. I like the title. The position. It's a distraction. I wasn't doing it for God. I was doing it for me. You know, youth pastor's got a nice ring to it. Totally wrong reasons. The ministry and the reason I was doing it was a complete distraction. I was not helping anybody. I wasn't. I was eclipsed. It was a distraction. Anything that distracts us is not worth the loss of our relationship to our Lord. It's not worth it. The gift isn't worth it losing contact with intimacy with the one who gives it to us. The work and ministry isn't worth it if we lose ourselves in activities and the next best program and we're not seeking God here. We can end up forgetting our first love. Think Matthew 16, 26. What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Okay, let's say you get everything. At what cost? At what cost are we seeking these things? Because if we're seeking it at the cost of blending in to the world to get what we want, whether it's a ministry, it's a program, whether it's money, whether it's a position, a new job, whatever, that new person, if it's costing us our relationship with God, that's too dangerous. That's too high of a price. What good is it to gain everything you wanted and lose your soul in the process? It's not worth it. Are there any type of these thorns in our lives that could be choking the word out of us, causing an eclipse in our, in our walk? Can you think of any? Is God bringing anything to your, to your mind? Second half of Matthew 5.14 reads, A city on a hill cannot be hidden. You guys ever seen a city on a hilltop? Think California. Cities on the hill and everything. Houses on the hill. You can see them all the time. You can see them during the day because the light reveals them. You can see them at night because the light shining out of their windows. You can't hide, a, you can't hide that. <laughs> the word for hidden in the Greek is crypto. Think encrypted or cryptography. It's the idea of concealing what is really there. Okay? Like I said earlier, would anybody in your circle of influence be shocked to find out you're a follower of Jesus? I had to ask myself that. Because that's very real for me, you know? Do we try to hide the fact that we're Christians? You know, the Bible says we are ambassadors for Christ, right? Doesn't the God's Word say that? We're ambassadors for Christ. We're not disciple ninjas or Christian transformers, Christians in disguise. We're not to be hidden. Verse 15 continues and says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But they put on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So Jesus states the obvious that uh, you don't light a candle and then cover it. That's common sense, right? We put it on a lampstand, placed in the middle of the room, so it can give light to everything and everybody there, right? It's not a hidden light. It mentions also the light is given to all who are in the house. And this was kind of, um, kind of another thing that I had to think about. Do those who are closest to you know that you love Jesus Christ, know that you're a Christian? Are we reflecting, and how are we reflecting Jesus in our own homes? Finally, verse 16 finishes up. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Sorry, getting scratchy here. This world needs to see the church reflecting Jesus. That is how the world gets changed. 
That is how things get changed in our inner circles, in our, you know, and in, in farther and farther out. When we're, <coughs> excuse me, when we're doing this and seeing God's people living out these beatitudes, God gets glorified. glorified. James 5.16 says, Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. So I'm going, uh, like I have been doing periodically throughout this, confess to you. God's word is a mirror. And as I studied this, like I said, he showed me some areas in my life that I was not reflecting him well at. You know, where my reflection of him is kind of hazy. Brought some things to mind that uh, definitely needed to change. You know, my attitude, the way I view people, my mouth at times. I can be pretty angry sometimes. I'm just being real. I need you guys to pray for me in this stuff. You know? Because uh, I want to reflect him well. Philippians 3.12 says, We haven't already reached perfection, but we press on to, per to possess that perfection. Okay? Nobody here can say that they have reached the top and they have no need of any more work. We can't say that. Nobody's, nobody's made it to the top yet. And that won't happen until we're in the presence of God with some new bodies. And praise God, because mine's starting to feel some wear and tear. Am I right? I'm ready for that. But where does it start? Again, Second Chronicles 7.14. God's people. It's got to start with us. Humbling ourselves, praying, seeking his face. We gotta turn, we gotta do the repentance. That's important. You can't grow if you're not humbling, praying, seeking God's face. You can't grow if you're not turning away from the sin that God's pointing out to you. We'll end up stagnating if we don't repent. We'll just sit there. All right, we'll go ahead and finish up here. Let's everybody go ahead and stand real quick. We'll go ahead and finish up. I'm going to pray in just a minute. But I want to ask you guys, are you experiencing any eclipses in your walk? Think about it. Are you experiencing any thorns? Are there any distractions that are causing you to, to lose your focus on Jesus? Is there any unconfessed sins that God is making you think of that you need to get out from under. Maybe you're struggling, struggling with living out loud and letting people know that you're a Christian. Are you that ninja in disguise, you know? <coughs> if any of you can relate to that, pray about it. I'm going to pray for you guys because uh, I know I need it and I'd ask you if you'd pray for me. And I ain't just praying for you because I think I'm special or got it together because I know I don't. Yes. Yeah, go I ahead. I think it's a good opportunity. <clears throat> I, there's probably some people here that you can like, I want to tag on what you're saying. Is if you're here tonight and you say, this is me. Everything he said right here is me. But I can't do it alone. You're not alone. And if you're bold enough to come up here, we'll pray with you. I mean, I, I even fall into this category right here of things that make it distracting, distract me. So if you're here tonight, I didn't mean to take over. No, you go right ahead. I'm pretty sure his heart is to pray with you. Absolutely. And to say, I'm going to I'm gonna join your arm for a second. Yes. Join arms with you, and we're going to do it together. That's right. Right? Yep. Amen. Amen. And not because I'm any better, because I'm not. The reason why is because I know where that's at. I've walked those roads. Some, some of the things, I'm still on those roads in which I would ask you to come up and pray for me. So if that's you, feel free. Come on up. We'll pray for you. Several of us will pray for you. Not just one person, not just me. We'll all pray. I'll start. I'll be bold enough to say there's things in my life that Absolutely. I feel like could be Absolutely. And there are in mine. So if that's you, come on up here. Father God, we give you glory. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we ask you, God, 
We ask you in Jesus' name that you would reveal to us those thorns in our lives, those eclipses that are happening, Lord, that you would, that you would bring them up to us, that you would show us, God, that we could confess them to you, that they would put them down on the altar in front of you, Lord, that you would cleanse us of that, heal us of that. Lord, we ask that you would help us, and that you would cleanse us and redeem us from these things. Give us grace, Lord, to walk worthy of your calling for us, Lord. We give you praise and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.